joy it is to have spent this week with you. And thank you, Anamai, for that introduction, very accurate to both the depth of sadness and disappointment and the joy of serving and the calling. And happy 32nd wedding anniversary to Anamai and Thomas Mueller. What an amazing ministry couple. We have been so richly blessed as a denomination, so happy anniversary to you both as well. We have experienced such richness from up here, haven't we? Amen? The theologians, the Levites, that have been leading us in worship with such depth, it has been such a balm to my soul to be led with such intentionality. Thank you. Thank you. Would you join me in gratitude? It takes a lot, the offering that you've poured out. So thank you. And thank you so much to Elder Patrick and as well Daniel and the rest of your team that have, has made EPC possible. It has been really a joy uh, to be here. I've appreciated so much the stories of your perseverance, of humility, of your call. And I thank you for how you've shared that in the conversations, in the hallways, and truly this has become a sacred place in here and in all of the spaces that we have inhabited because the Holy Spirit has been among us. And that's the greatest gift. I want you to see those faces that Anamai just spoke of just for a moment. I bring you greetings from Azure Hills Church as well as Southeastern California Conference of the North American Division where I serve. And these are those faces of my beloved ones, uh, Caleb, my husband of 21 years, and Josiah and Ava. So you can put together the faces. I love seeing your dear ones on your phones as we've met. These are my beloved ones. Now, as we open up the word of God, would you pause once more to pray together with me? I invite you to just surrender anything else that might be on your mind or heart to place it in the hands of God. What a great gift it is to be in your presence, oh God. I pray that you would speak to our hearts. And speak what you know we need to hear. In the name of our Jesus, amen. Carl Jung tells a story about a patient. He was actually a minister. And he was addicted to his work. He labored 80 to 90 hours per week. And he was suffering from debilitating ennui. And Jung asked him to get alone with himself for two nights and then to come back. And so the first night, the minister listened to Beethoven and read poetry. The second night, he listened to Mozart and he read a novel. He went back to Dr. Yun and asked, who asked how he had spent his time. He recounted to him what he had done and Yun responded immediately, no, that's not what I asked you to do. I asked you to spend time not with Mozart, but with yourself. To which the minister replied, but I can't stand to be with myself like that. And Dr. Yoon said, this is the self you are inflicting on everyone else 80 to 90 hours per week. The question I ask you tonight is who are you becoming? I've come to believe that more than the position we hold and the particulars of what we're doing, the Lord cares about our character. Who are we becoming? Who am I becoming? Who is the self that you are bringing to your life and ministry 
to your relationships with the people around you. Christianity is not just about belief. Seventh-day Adventist faith is not just about belief in our heads, but about putting our faith into action. As spiritual leaders, as pastors, as directors, as administrators, I want to remind you that we are first disciples. Disciples of Jesus, followers of the way. It is imperative for us to understand that it is not just knowing, as we've heard from here on this very platform, but our being and our doing that is what makes holistic discipleship. The good news for you and I is that discipleship is a lifelong process of growth in Christ. That is good news. Every single day, you and I wake up with the opportunity to say, I surrender to this love that has been pursuing me. And that is one of my absolute favorite songs, the goodness of God that keeps chasing after me because I can testify today with all of my heart that God has been good. That all my life, God has been faithful. That God has pursued me that grace went before me and behind me, around me and within me, and that I have been responding to this grace of God my entire life because God sought me first. Glory, hallelujah. This grace of God. So discipleship is a lifelong pursuit, but it is also a lifelong response to the one who keeps coming towards us and finding us again and again. The fastest track to burnout is to talk about things that you're not experiencing. Write about it, preach about it, make sure others are doing it, but don't experience Jesus in your own life. Review and Herald, September 2, 1890, this quote says here, the minister cannot give to others that which he or she, I know she meant that, does not possess. Many are able to talk upon the doctrinal points, but they are ignorant to the lessons of Christ. Such men and women cannot be a blessing either in the pulpit or at the fireside. She's saying, if you don't know Jesus yourself, what do you have to say? Really? Anne Merrill Lindbergh said, if one is out of touch with with oneself, then one cannot touch others. There are recent studies that have found out, what we know to be true, that one of the chief factors that contributes to grit and resilience in pastoral ministry in the Adventist church is quiet time with Jesus. This is no surprise, right? You know that experience when you come and you sit in the presence of the living God and you receive more than what you had when you started. There's something that happens there. We've experienced this. Whether you say I'm spending time in my morning devotions or prayer or I'm taking space to be with God, whatever you call it, these are describing practices that make room for God in our lives. More than that, it's an acknowledgement that I am not what I do, that there's more going on, that there is a mystery to this faith in God I've run across so many different beautiful names, habits, practices, invitations, disciplines. In deep calling, I use this phrase, calls, because for me it's been important to acknowledge that it's always in response to the invitation of God. It's always about God saying, come, because I've called you, you are coming to me. Because we can turn discipleship into another form of legalism. It's just a different set of knowledge that we're talking about, a different checklist perhaps, but it's about responding to the one who calls me. And that's what changes everything. The eight calls of God in deep calling are just devotion, prayer, rest, community, healing, witness, service, and blessing. These have been life to my soul. I speak to you about what has been and is saving my life, tangible habits that have shaped me. These habits, whatever you call them, are not grace themselves, but are avenues of God's grace. These take the form of my own discipleship journey, 
as well as how I disciple others. Because Jesus says, come follow me, join me in what I'm doing in the world and do it in community. That's my definition of discipleship. Jesus says and invites me to come follow after. I can't cover all the calls today, so I'm going to focus on just one that's specific to the pastor's spiritual health, the call to bless, the prophetic voice. Perhaps you've heard the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Have you heard that lie? Yeah, it's an absolute lie. Absolutely words can hurt us. Just as much as someone taking blows to our body, words can echo in our minds and hearts coming back to haunt us. The enemy can use those to get down inside of our soul. Can you remember words that were said to you that tore you down? Maybe it was another colleague, maybe it was an administrator, maybe it was your parent, maybe it was a church member or someone on the church board, but can you recall those words that tore you down? Words also have the tremendous power to build up and to heal. Can you remember words that made you feel seen and known and valued? Can you recall some of those words? Is there someone that spoke life into you just at the right moment? Perhaps they're in this room. Someone God sent to you just at the right time. Words can actually move us closer into the presence of God. Words can remind us of who we're called to be and the kind of person that God has spoken that we will be. The words that were spoken from Matthew 3, 16 to 17, hear them once more. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven opened and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, alighting on him. And a voice from heaven cried out, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He comes out into the desert to be baptized by John and he hears these words spoken over him. This is my son. I'm pleased with him. This is before Jesus has done a single miracle. This is before Jesus has preached a single sermon. This is before Jesus has given himself as a ransom for many, bring us into closer communion and connection with God, bridging the gap between us. He's done nothing. And the start of his ministry is this. I believe it's a scene that defined his entire ministry where God spoke to his identity and his belovedness. He faces temptation in the wilderness and Mark 1 says after he hears these words that the spirit leads him out into the desert. Immediately after he knows for sure his identity in God, the spirit leads him out to be tempted to face a desert season. Have you ever been in the desert? Does your throat feel that familiar parched feeling? Perhaps you're in the desert right now. What got Jesus through the desert, what got Jesus beyond the trial, were these very words God spoke over him. You are my beloved. Jesus came to remind us how God feels towards us. This very same thing is spoken over you and I. We are called to work from belovedness, not to belovedness. We are called to work from our belovedness, not towards somehow earning something which is already ours. One of the people that did this so well in my life is Pastor Salem Elias. He moved from Iraq to Lebanon and then to Loma Linda, California, where he served at Azure Hills Church since 1976. From full-time pastor to part-time pastor to quarter-time pastor and then retired, 
and then he passed away in 2021. But imagine the impact that he had over all of these years in the life of our congregation. For five years, I experienced this very profoundly. I remember when I got to Azure Hills, his family wasn't sure how he would receive me. A woman senior pastor. Culturally, this is something that they didn't believe their father would be open to. But I remember meeting him for the first time as he rolled his walker towards the door to greet me after my sermon. He looked at me and he said, beloved, I love you. <laughs> and he gave me a big hug. And that was how he was with everyone. Arms stretched out wide. They said, that's their memory. I met someone in the community that hadn't been to our church in 15 years. And they said, is Pastor Elias still there? And by that time, he was very old and feeble. But I said, yes, he is. And they said, you know what he always did? Stood with outstretched arms to give me a hug whenever I came in. And during that era, we weren't very kind to those who were going through a divorce. And this person said, when I went through my divorce, he was the only one whom I knew accepted me. That's the kind of love that he embodied in his life. So for five years, I heard, beloved, I love you. Beloved, I love you. Pastor Elias embodied this love for all of us. The light in his eyes is the way that our God looks at us even now. You are God's beloved. It is this identity of, as God's beloved that can shape the way that we live and work and serve in the world. Genesis chapter 12, 1 to three says, the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. I will bless you so that you can be a blessing. The covenant God makes with Abraham and Sarah is to be a blessing to all those who come in contact with them. The ones who believe God and those who don't. Everyone can sense God's blessing on them and to them. The blessing of God doesn't stay with us. The covenant God makes with God's people is for the sake of humanity. They would be a channel of God's blessing even down to us today, generations later. The call to bless is a call to affirm life where we find it, to build others up, to speak affirmation, to offer hope, to bring good news, to lean into what is not yet. This is one of my favorite verses in the scriptures, Romans 4, 17. Romans 4, 17, the God who gives life to the dead and calls that which is not as though it were. One of my favorite verses, because God comes along and says, it's not yet, but it will be. <laughs> Calling that which is not as though it were. God says, I love you, I accept you completely, and I can't wait for you to experience the more that I have planned. Let me call that which is not as though it were. And then we as children after him come in people's lives and we see what they don't see yet. And so we come with words of life and blessing and we speak over them things that are not yet a reality for them. And we call that which is not as though it were. Perhaps the way that we are struggling with discipleship and what it looks like is because we read Psalm 1 and it says you will be like a tree planted by the springs of water and we picture this kind of tree right here, the stately oak that stands all alone, strong and proud. But the next picture is a grove of aspens. And aspens are different than oaks. Aspens are one organism. So you look and you see many, but they all share a singular root system. They're all connected underneath the ground and their strength is in their shared roots. That's the body of Christ. Maybe 
just maybe, our discipleship would look different if we weren't trying to be the stately singular tree, but we're instead embracing that we are a grove of aspens, all rooted and connected together in Christ, all meant to build up and support one another. We are called to interdependence. Come, follow me together and join me in what we're doing here on this earth, bringing the kingdom making the invisible God visible in the lives of the people we come in contact with. When I lack courage, you have it. The point of faith was never to stand on our own. The point of faith is to stand together. When I don't have hope, you have it. We come alongside each other to know and to be known When I don't remember the big picture of God's story, you come along and you remind me of what it is. We hold on to hope with each other. In the Gospel of Mark, when Jesus calls the disciples, he says, come after me and I will make you to become fishers of people. In the words of commentator Andre Resner, the extra word become implies that for Mark, following Jesus is a process of becoming something that only Jesus can bring about in the disciples' life. I will cause you to become as you follow after me. So, who are we becoming? Being a disciple is a lifelong process of growth in Christ. We can't expect change overnight. We come to Jesus, we become disciples, and there's transformation in the process. It involves our head, it involves our heart, it involves our hands. Edna Butterfield tells this story that I love, and it's about her husband, Ron, who teaches mentally impaired teenagers, and he teaches them to do things that they didn't expect that they could do. He teaches them how to make repairs on electronics, how to play chess, how to do things with their hands. And as he does this, he tries to inspire them to believe in themselves. There should be a picture of a toaster that you'll see just a moment, because he knew this one young man had really started to internalize what Ron was teaching him when he came in one day with a broken toaster under one arm, and under the other arm, a half loaf of bread. It's broken, but I expect it to be fixed. It's broken, but here's the bread ready to be toast as soon as this is repaired. That's what speaking what not yet is as though it were is all about. We come along in people's lives and we say it's broken, it's not yet fixed, yet we carry the bread ready for the healing and the restoration that will come. I am broken and I am also whole. You are broken and you are also whole. The church is broken and yet our story is one of wholeness. It's one of moving towards restoration. It's one of expecting repair, redemption, restoration. There's power in the words that we speak into one another's lives. When we experience brokenness and pain, our words can cause a shift so powerful that it can help us to hold two realities at the very same time, our brokenness and our wholeness, our fear and our courage. What is hope? Hope is being able to see from where I am now to a future that is good. I believe the core of the Adventist message is an optimistic outlook on the present and the future. That we embody a prophetic voice of hope. Can you imagine if that's what Seventh-day Adventists were known for? Every time I run into those people, they're speaking hope. Every time I run into them, it's like they see something that's not yet and they're living into something beautiful. Every time those Seventh-day Adventists come along, they stand in the gap between what is and what will be. The broken and the whole. 
They stand as a prophetic voice of what our neighborhood, what our society can be. We, as Adventists, believe there's reason to expect good things. Great things have happened. I witnessed beautiful things this week in the Trans-European Division. The stories that were told up here and in the hallways and in the workshop rooms were inspiring. And God wants to do even more. I have hope because our God delights in showing up and speaking into our lives. If you have been holding only the brokenness, I invite you to not give up because you are also God's beloved. And God not only prophesies over you that you can be a blessing, but your own wholeness and healing as well. What will we focus on? Or rather, who will we focus on? In the most challenging situations of my life, in the dark nights of my soul, God has invited me back to fix my eyes upon Jesus to stay open to the Holy Spirit, to surrender. You see, God's call to bless is first in response to the blessing of God over us, knowing that we are God's beloved, and then letting that blessing flow to those in our lives. We're called to work from our belovedness. I believe we're called to repent of the simple pathway of just denouncing what we disagree with, and what is not good in our society or in our neighborhoods or what we disagree with in their theology, but rather to be proactive about sharing blessing, to trust God in living the message of the kingdom right here, right now. This little one right here, he's now 10 years old, but I will never forget this conversation when he was four. That's when this picture was taken. And his sister was just a baby. We welcomed both of our kids into our lives from birth by adoption. And so Josiah has always known his story and his name uh, because my father, he's named, his middle name is Edward after my father who never got to meet his grandkids because he died in his 50s from cancer. So I've told him and his father's told him he's Josiah, which means God heals, and Edward after his grandfather. So Josiah Edward is proud of his name. And this person came along and they said, Josiah, can I call you Sia? As adults often do to kids, make up nicknames for them. But he hadn't yet had that nickname, now he's called it all the time because of his sister. But I was overhearing this, he didn't see me, I was a little bit away, but I heard my son say this. It's one of my favorite moments I return to. He said, no, you can't call me Sia, but you can call me beloved. That's what my mom calls me. I said, if I do nothing else, God, that's exactly what I want my child to know, that he's beloved. I want him to know deep in his being that God, you love him deeply, and that his father and I love him deeply too. And that's core to my calling. I want every person I encounter, God, to know that they are beloved to know that they are so deeply loved and that there's hope and life spoken over them, that people would recognize as they experience me that they are of deep value. Our identity as the beloved of God, this intimacy with Jesus that moves us to pour out this blessing wherever we go. I could have easily chose so many because I've really loved meeting each of you. I could have chose Gavin or Lydia or Sonia or Tabitha or Thomas or Anamai, or I could have chose Daniel or Christina or Billy or James or Laszlo or Judel. I could have chosen so many people because I've been so blessed by the conversations that we've had. But I'd like to invite Pastor Jadana to come forward. I met her yesterday. Could you just join me and help me out for a moment? She has had zero warning about this, so I'm so grateful. Could you give her a hand? (laughs) 
This uh, Pastor Jadana from Denmark that I had the great privilege of meeting yesterday. In just a few moments, I'm going to invite you to bless someone here in this room. And I'd like to bless you. It was a joy to meet you yesterday. So I'd like you to offer the same to someone around you. If it's comfortable for them and for you, may I place my hand on your shoulder? Is that okay with you? Pastor Jadana, you are God's beloved daughter and God is pleased with you. You have God's favor and God's smile. I was deeply blessed by the well of passion within you. Your passion for God's children and your desire to see them not lost or slipping through the cracks, but that they would be companioned as they learn what it looks like to follow Jesus. I see you and I value what you bring into this world and into this church and into the ministry. God bless you. Would you take a moment and find someone else to bless? As our praise team comes forward in this moment, we'll just give a few moments for you to just find one other person and with their permission to say at the beginning, you are God's beloved son or daughter. God is pleased with you. And then if you know anything about their life or if you have learned anything about their life, to just speak briefly about that to them and then allow them to do the same. And we'll just take a few moments at this moment to do that, if you would. Speak a word of blessing. And then I'm going to invite you with the first question to just take a picture of it because you can do that later at another time to listen to what God might be speaking into your life too. Would you just do that right now, like it's non-rhetorical? Just stand to your feet right now and turn to someone next to you and in a literal sense, take a moment to bless them and allow them to bless you.
for those of you who have concluded your blessing, we will sing. But if you are still in the midst of your blessing and your prayer, we invite you to continue. But for those who are ready, we invite you to sing. Let's stand up for our last song.
Let us pray. O oh, dear beloved sons and daughters of God, may you too sense God's smile, God's favor, God's absolute delight in you. May you hear God's song sung over you and from this place of one deeply blessed and deeply loved, may you dare to love. May we share that belovedness, that hope, that prophetic voice of blessing in the name of Jesus, empowered by his spirit until we see him. Oh God, we long for you. Amen.